Permettez-moi de vous dire quelques mots sur l'Institut d'études avancées. L'Institut d'études avancées de Nantes est une fondation indépendante, reconnue d'utilité publique, qui reçoit pour la durée d'une année universitaire et de façon renouvelée chaque année, un nombre de chercheurs sélectionnés par son conseil scientifique pour la qualité et l'originalité de leurs travaux. Depuis l'année dernière, la sélection n'est plus totalement libre parce qu'elle est orientée par l'art scientifique choisi par l'Institut qui a été validé par son conseil d'administration. Il s'agit de travaux qui s'inscrivent dans trois axes principaux. Le premier axe, c'est l'armature dogmatique des sociétés, c'est l'axe d'origine de l'Institut. Mais à cet axe, nous avons ajouté deux autres, la mésologie et l'écoumène et les libertés académiques et de recherche. Ces axes ont été dictés par les mutations que nous observons dans le monde. C'est inspirant des modèles de Princeton et de Berlin. L'Institut d'études mise sur la liberté et la créativité des chercheurs. Dans une organisation de la recherche de plus en plus marquée par la fragmentation du travail scientifique, la contrainte budgétaire, la programmation des activités de recherche, la politique de l'Institut consiste à permettre aux chercheurs résidents, que nous appelons affectueusement « fellow » ici, de s'extraire provisoirement de leur cadre habituel de travail, de leur cadre institutionnel, pour venir passer un temps de réflexion entièrement dépouillé des contraintes du quotidien ici à l'Institut, au bord de ce magnifique bras de la Loire, dans ce bâtiment qui offre l'essentiel des commodités parmi lesquelles cette salle de travail et beaucoup d'autres, et puis un lieu de résidence particulier. C'est un environnement propice à la sérendipité, composé des chercheurs et qui viennent d'horizons et des disciplines variées. Donc nous accueillons ici des chercheurs de toutes les disciplines de sciences sociales, y compris des chercheurs des autres disciplines qui modélisent les sciences sociales. L'année dernière, par exemple, nous avons accueilli une mathématicienne qui travaillait sur la modélisation des, espaces, des espèces invasives. Remettant en cause les routines intellectuelles de chaque membre, l'Institut est avant tout un lieu d'innovation intellectuelle et une pépinière de nouveaux réseaux de collaboration durable. Beaucoup de partenariats se nouent pendant la durée des résidences. Dave nous en dira peut-être un mot. Et il s'agit de tisser des relations d'un type nouveau. Et l'Institut mise beaucoup sur les relations incluant les Sud. Il s'agit de faire des collaborations qui impliquent autant que faire se peut, la présence des Sud. Le programme de séjour qui est l'ADN de l'Institut est complété et soutenu par deux autres activités qui permettent à l'Institut de ne pas être fermé, mais de s'ouvrir au monde qui l'entoure. La première ouverture est extra -muros. Il nous arrive d'exporter des activités. Nous avons un partenaire historique qu'on appelle le lieu unique, qui nous permet d'accueillir des chercheurs, des journalistes, des professeurs, des universitaires qui travaillent sur une question sociale qui a un impact direct sur la société à l'occasion d'une discussion qu'on appelle, euh, nous appelons cela idée, idée débat. Idée débat avec le public, ça permet à l'Institut d'amener les faits au dehors et on débat avec les autres membres du public. Le lieu unique n'est pas loin d'ici, c'est de l'autre côté. À côté de cette activité, il y a une autre qui est intramuros. L'Institut permet à des fellows résidents, pendant leur résidence, d'organiser des ateliers ou des colloques. L'Institut permet également à des anciens fellows de venir organiser des colloques et des activités avec son soutien. Et l'activité que nous avons aujourd'hui rentre dans ce deuxième volet. Habituellement, les fellows organisent très souvent des ateliers qui sont moins lourds, mais là, nous avons eu un excellent fellow cette année qui a décidé d'organiser un véritable colloque pendant sa résidence. 
C'est un défi extraordinaire et je suis déjà très heureux de plusieurs parce que j'ai vu le nombre de participants, la qualité des participants et je ne doute pas un seul instant de la qualité des travaux que nous allons avoir. Euh, là, je dois redire tout le plaisir que j'ai Dave à participer à cette activité. Merci de m'avoir invité. Je l'appelle Dave, mais son nom c'est David Prichard. On l'appelle affectueusement ici. Et son collègue Ian Worthington que je découvre. Je découvre à l'occasion. Merci d'être venu à Nantes. Ce colloque est important pour l'Institut à deux titres. D'abord, par son envergure. Le colloque est important par son envergure et par la richesse de la thématique. Relativement à l'envergure, il est porté par deux chercheurs de très haut vol. Il regroupe des chercheuses et des chercheurs de très grande qualité de ce que j'ai pu entendre à l'occasion des échanges d'accueil lors du repas hier. Pour ce qui est de la richesse de la thématique, le colloque a pour thème général, vous excuserez mon anglais, « Fourth century attempts at war » after Claude Mosset. J'ai cherché à bien comprendre le titre et j'ai eu la chance de recevoir un papier de David Prichard qui a traduit le thème en L'Athènes du 4e siècle en guerre à la suite de Claus Mossé. Comme les traductions fidèles sont rares, je me suis demandé si la traduction la plus proche ne consistait pas à enlever l'apostrophe pour dire non pas l'Athènes, mais plutôt Athènes. Mais bon, vous savez, ça peut aussi changer en fonction des traducteurs. Et vous allez vous demander pourquoi je m'accroche à la traduction du titre. C'est qu'en réalité, dans un colloque d'histoire, en dehors d'ouvrir et d'avoir des propos aimables, un juriste a tout à apprendre. Et pendant ce colloque, je vais certainement apprendre un certain nombre de notions fondamentales. Je vais profiter de ce colloque pour apprendre des notions d'histoire, pour apprendre la guerre dans l'histoire, pour apprendre des démocraties, sur la démocratie athénienne sans doute, pour apprendre sur la contribution de l'histoire à la compréhension des événements du monde contemporain. Voilà le peu que je puisse dire en ce qui concerne le fond. Je voudrais terminer mon propos en remerciant Dave de m'avoir invité à prendre la parole pour ses propos d'accueil. Je dois adresser des remerciements à toute l'équipe qui a organisé votre arrivée ici. Je pense notamment à Elise, à Una, à Mélanie, à Bertie, et à Dimitri qui est ici avec nous. Mais je dois aussi adresser des remerciements à la chef d'orchestre de tout ça. C'est Emmanuel Garcia, notre secrétaire général, directrice exécutive, qui coordonne toute l'équipe qui a permis votre venue ici. En remettant la parole, je vous souhaite à tous et à toutes un excellent colloque. Merci. Merci. Merci beaucoup, uh, Pierre Etienne, and thank you again uh, on behalf of all of us for uh, kindly hosting us here and for your kind words uh, this morning. I'd like to introduce second, uh, someone who really needs no introduction, but again, someone to whom we owe a, a great debt of thanks, and that is David Pritchard himself. Um, David has carved out uh, a reputation as a leading historian, both in Australia and internationally, Uh, for his uh, groundbreaking work in, in, in ancient history, in particular his examination of the uh, cultural significance of, of warfare in the Greek world. Uh, one of his great contributions also has been in bringing other scholars together for very profitable uh, dialogues. And I'm sure I'm not alone in looking forward very much to the release of uh, the work Uh, on the funeral oration uh, inspired by the re-examination of Nicole uh, Loro's uh, foundational text. Um, David, thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, good morning. Bonjour tout le monde. Je remercie chaleureusement Lara O'Sullivan pour sa présentation très généreuse. Je vous souhaite la bienvenue à ce colloque latin du quatrième siècle en guerre à la suite de Claude Mosé. Bien sûr, je suis absolument ravi de vous voir toutes et tous ici à Nantes. Mais je dois malheureusement commencer par vous présenter mes excuses. Je suis vraiment désolé de mal parler la langue française. Pour 
une personne de mon âge, très avancée, et on n'est pas facile de maîtriser la langue parlée. Par conséquent, je tenterai seulement de présenter des remerciements et de dire quelques mots très simples sur la pertinence contemporaine de ces colloques. Le premier groupe de personnes que Ian Worthington et moi-même tenons à remercier son nom conférencière et conférencier. Ils ont déjà consacré énormément de temps à ce projet. Chaque une et chaque un entre elles et eux a écrit une conférence très importante. Et nombre ont voyagé de très longues distances pour venir en France. Le deuxième remerciement s'adresse aux autres participants à ces colloques. Cette manifestation scientifique est autant plus riche que vous y participez. L'Institut d'études avancées de Nantes est un centre de recherche remarquable et très innovant. Ian et moi avons une vraie dette de reconnaissance envers son équipe professionnelle pour le travail dur sur ce projet. Nous remercions particulièrement Elise Michaud, Una Artus, Mélanie Sinclair et Dimitri Bastard. Bien sûr, on dit que l'argent fait tourner le monde. En conséquence, il est naturel que les derniers remerciements s'adressent à nos partenaires financiers, à savoir le Conseil australien de la recherche, le Fonds Aroni, l'Institut d'études savantes de Nantes, l'Université Macquarie et l'Université de Queensland. Madame et Messieurs, Aujourd'hui, les Européens espèrent toujours que l'Ukraine pourra gagner la guerre choquant en cours. Beaucoup continuent également d'espérer que la démocratie sera un facteur décisif pour la victoire des Ukrainiens. Je crois que l'histoire de l'Antiquité peut nous aider à déterminer si ces espoirs sont fondés ou ils sont peu réalistes. Lorsque la Russie a déclenché cette guerre, certains ont craint que la résistance ukrainienne ne soit vouée à l'échec. La, la Russie est beaucoup plus grande et beaucoup plus riche. Elle possède plus de, de soldats et d'armes que l'Ukraine. En premier, cette de, disproportion elle-même ne suffit à, à assurer à la Russie une victoire rapide. Les dirigeants européens ont fini par penser autrement et ont décidé de soutenir militairement l'Ukraine. Ce faisant, ils partagent un espoir démocratique. Cet espoir est que l'Ukraine, en sa qualité de, de démocratie naissante, peut mener la guerre beaucoup mieux que la Russie autocratique. Les Dirigeants européens supposent aussi que leur propre démocratie sont en mesure de trouver la meilleure façon de fournir un soutien militaire aux Ukrainiens. L'histoire nous donne les moyens d'évaluer le bien fondé de ces de tels espoirs. Néanmoins, certains pourraient se montrer sceptiques. Quant à la capacité de l'histoire de la Grèce antique à faire cela. Mais si je suis ici en France, c'est que les historiens français de la, de la Grèce d'Antiquité ont réfuté ces doutes après la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Jean-Pierre Vernon, Pierre Veranaké, Nicole Leroux, Claude Mosset et des autres historiens français ont complètement bouleversé notre compréhension de la Grèce antique. Ce cercle que l'on appelle le Corps de Paris a établi de manière incontestable que l'histoire de l'Antiquité est bonne à penser. Les études sur la Grèce antique nous aident à évaluer nos hypothèses concernant le monde moderne. 
bien sûr l'âge d'or de la terre antique se situait au cinquième siècle avant Jésus-Christ. C'est au cours de ce siècle qu'Athènes a porté la démocratie à sa perfection et qu'elle était à la pointe de l'innovation culturelle. En fait, moi, connu et l'autre côté de cet âge d'or, les Athéniens du cinquième siècle sont vite devenus une des deux superpuissances du monde grec et ils ont complètement transformé l'art de la guerre. S'agissant de leurs effectifs et de leur professionnalisme, les forces armées saténiennes étaient sans égal. La chronologie de ces succès militaires, de ces succès, succès militaires est frappante. Cette transformation s'est produite tout juste après qu'Athènes est devenue une démocratie. Il serait facile de conclure que les circonstances de l'Athènes du 5e siècle vont dans le sens de nos espoirs. Page 3. La leçon à en tirer serait très simple. L'Ukraine démocratique pourrait également connaître un grand succès militaire. En revanche, il se trouve que l'histoire de cet âge d'or soit beaucoup plus complexe. L'Athènes du 5e siècle avait une population dix fois supérieure à celle d'une cité-état grecque moyenne. En tant que superpuissance, Athènes pouvait aussi créer un, un empire composé de 250 cités-états. Comme elle les taxait assez lourdement, Athènes disposait un budget annuel dix fois supérieur à celui d'un État grec standard. Par conséquent, l'Athènes du 5e siècle était tout simplement beaucoup plus riche et beaucoup plus grande que les autres États grecs. Ainsi, ces seuls chiffres seraient les, les principales raisons de la réussite militaire athénienne. Cela mettra en doute nos espoirs concernant l'Ukraine. Cela pourrait même suggérer que la Russie autocratique serait en mesure de gagner la guerre en cours. Un autre fait, moi, connu au sujet de l'Athènes antique, est que son histoire comprend deux périodes distinctes. Après l'âge d'or célèbre, il y avait l'Athènes du IVe siècle. La puissance des Athéniens du siècle précédent a débouché sur une réponse militaire massive de la part de leur zone amie. Sparte, l'autre superpuissance grecque, s'est associée à l'Empire Perse pour écraser Athènes. De nombreux cités-états de l'Empire athénien ont décidé de soutenir la réponse militaire de Sparte et de Perse parce qu'elle se sentait exploitée. <coughs> Après une guerre de 30 ans, la guerre de Péloponnèse, cette coalition gréco-perse a remporté la victoire sur Athènes. En 404, euh, en 404 avant Jésus-Christ, cette dernière a ainsi perdu son empire et la grande richesse qui en découlait. De plus, durant ces 30 années de guerre, Athènes a perdu la moitié de sa pop pop population. Il en résultait que l'Athènes du IVe siècle n'était ni plus grande, ni plus riche que les autres États grecs. En revanche, dans cette deuxième moitié de son histoire, elle était toujours une démocratie. Or, c'est oh, cette période d'après-guerre qui fait de l'Athènes de l'Antiquité une leçon d'histoire si importante pour nous aujourd'hui. Si, de manière générale, la vie politique démocratique rendait les Athéniens plus efficaces sur le plan militaire, 
on devrait s'attendre à de nouvelles réussites militaires au cours du quatrième siècle. Bien sûr, la démocratie serait la, la seule raison principale de ce succès d'après-guerre. Nous serions sur page 4, qu'elle a toujours eu un impact positif sur la façon dont les Athéniens de l'époque classique menaient les guerres. Le Code de Paris était réputé de ne reconnaître aucune réussite à l'Athènes d'après la guerre du Péloponnèse. Pendant des décennies, cette vision pessimiste a façonné la manière dont les historiens de l'Antiquité du monde entier ont compris l'histoire athénienne du IVe siècle. Ce cercle parisien soutenait qu'Athènes ne se serait jamais remise de la guerre du Péloponnèse, sombrant dans une grave crise. Le Code de Paris s'accordait également à dire que l'Athènes d'après-guerre aurait été un échec militaire complet. Notamment, Claude Mosset a soutenu que les Athéniens du IVe siècle auraient refusé de manière croissante de servir dans les forces armées, laissant la place à des mercenaires. Par conséquent, il n'aurait plus été en mesure de déployer ni, ni flotte ni armée nécessaire à la protection de leur État. D'après Mosé, le nouvel empire qu'ils ont créé aurait été bien plus exploiteur que celui du Ve siècle. Mosé a même affirmé que la démocratie elle-même aurait été une raison majeure de les échecs militaires de l'Athènes d'après-guerre. Notre projet en France remet en question cette vision française traditionnelle. Cette vision française traditionnelle. Ce, nouveau, ce projet démontre de manière incontestable que l'Athènes d'après-guerre a emprunté une voie très semblable à de l'Europe après la Seconde Guerre mondiale, comme l'Europe d'après-guerre. Athènes s'est rétabli très vite après la guerre du Péloponnèse. Ce nouveau projet français confirme que l'Athènes du IVe siècle était une vraie réussite de la terre. L'Athènes d'après-guerre a pu déployer des flottes et des armées suffisantes pour protéger ses intérêts vitaux. Elle est vite devenue une puissance régionale majeure et une, une fois de plus la première puissance maritime de la Grèce. En tirant des leçons de leurs erreurs, les Athéniens ont fondé un nou nouvel empire beaucoup moins exploiteur. Le pourcentage de ceux d'entre eux ont rôlé dans l'armée a même augmenté au cours du IVe siècle. Notre projet en France ne laisse planer aucun doute sur le fait que la démocratie a été la principale raison de ce nouveau succès militaire. Ce feu faisant, il confirme également qu'elle a été une raison majeure de la domination militaire d'Athènes durant son âge d'or. La réussite militaire remportée pendant deux siècles conforte l'hypothèse, page 5, selon laquelle la politique démocratique a vraiment joué un rôle déterminant dans l'effort de guerre athénéen. En fin de compte, il se trouve que l'Athènes de l'Antiquité était des espoirs européens concernant l'Ukraine. Nous avons de bonnes raisons d'espérer que la montée de la démocratie donne aux Ukrainiens un avantage décisif dans cette guerre terrible. En tant que démocratie, les États européens sont en mesure de prendre 
des, des, des décisions judicieuses sur les meilleures manières de soutenir militairement l'Ukraine. Merci. Thank you. Strange, quick uh, expression for our uh, first full-length paper of the session. Uh, it takes it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Vincent Gabriel from Ben Kim Crescent to uh, Professor Gabriel from Jenny's recent introduction, uh, a long-term uh, leading writer at the University of Copenhagen. I understand that uh, Vincent is now enjoying some form of retirement in the sunny. Signs of uh, uh, Caristus, uh, but he's no less active uh, post retirement in his academic work. Uh, that academic work has forged new frontiers for all of us and in our understandings of the uh, Navy in particular, and particularly the interplay uh, of naval affairs and the economic realm uh, of classical antiquity. Uh, today, uh, Vincent will be uh, talking to us on a subject that must be fundamental to this entire conference, uh, and that is the naval power of Athens uh, in the fourth century. Naval power, of course, such an underpinning of Athenian greatness in the fifth century, uh, the trajectory of that power must be fundamental to our assessment uh, of its performance in the fourth. Thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you. Are my audible? Thank you. The Athenian Navy in the 4th century BC. Restoration, implementation, transformation, introduction. Although the Athenian Navy does not receive special treatment in any of the Claude Mosse's published works, the views about the Navy's ineffectiveness after 4 and 4 BC is a bedrock premise of the 1962 thesis about Athens' decline. While the Navy retained its importance, Museum Vincent, lack of public funds did not permit the Athenians to use it optimally. Thereby, Museum joined the then prevalent historiographical tradition, which had been founded in 87 to by Frederick Gass in the third volume of his Atti Atishat of Etzonkai, and which relied almost exclusively on the Bosnian's persistent complaining about the shortcomings of the Navy. A decisive break with that tradition occurred with George Cockburn's radical re-evaluation of the issue in 1984. The fourth century Navy, Cockburn concluded, and I quote, was as good as it could be, unquote, and the view that it was the naval system that led in Athens' ruling is false. As for the wider issue of the alleged failure of post World War Athens, it was laid to rest by, among others, Peter Rose in the seminal paper of 2012. Recent work on the Navy, while attending to shortcomings, is less prone to speak of decline, raised inscriptional evidence, especially the naval records, higher than the exceptions of the ethnic Attic orators, and refers investigating the issue of how Athens' principal organization of violence transformed itself, revitalizing in the process the Athenian society and sectors of the economy. Situating itself within this latter historiographical landscape and using the template of an assessment the present paper charts those continuities and changes that define the historical trajectories of the Navy from 4043 to 323 2 BC. The focus is on three parallel running, but often also intersecting processes restoration, incrementation, and transformation. All three, it will be argued, have important ramifications not only for the modalities of maritime violence, but also for Athenian statehood 
and Athens economy at large. The Navy of 325 BC is concluded was just as strong as, if not stronger than, that of 431 BC. But its operational logic, institutional setting, and financial base were quite different from those of its 5th century predecessor. Different enough for us to speak of the new navy of the 4th century. A fundamental continuity is, though, this. Violence at sea and the means of exerting it remained a dearly guarded monopoly of the Athenian state. From the moment it became Athens' principal institution of violence around 483 BC and in contrast to arcade practices, the navy came under the exclusive ownership and control of the state, but is practically of the supreme bodies of government. The assembly and council. <clears throat> From the 480s onward, the entire fleet was to be publicly owned, maintained, and operated. The use of public warships for private purposes was strictly banned, while no privately owned warships were permitted within the Athenian naval establishment. The private and the naval had become separated and irreconcilable. With this change, autonomous naval action and enrichment was dedicated to the area of the illicit, the domain of the unalienated. Having served Athens well in the 5th century, state monopoly of violence at sea thus persisted as the hallmark of the new navy. Section 2 Restoration in Chronication. Restoration commands quickly after the naval emasculation to follow the defeat of 404 BC, proceeding slowly but steadily until 378 it thereafter accelerated dramatically, reaching and soon surpassing 5th century levels. Our main indicators are two principal components of the organization which our sources call <coughs> from now to call the Navy. One component is the fleet of Chinese, which the defeat of 443 had downsized to 12 units. While early 4th century operations, for instance, commons found the Peloponnese in 1993 93 2, main part had been conducted with Persian ships, by 387 Athens had probably 50 to 70 Chinese of its own. <coughs> <coughs> From 378-7 onwards, when the solid evidence of the naval records becomes available, the augmentation is seen to gather pace almost yearly. To exemplify the situation, I cite the figures from the few years. From over 103 ships in 378-7, the number climbs to 283 ships in 350. 57, 6, to 410 ships in 330-29 and to 470 ships in 435-4. The known 5th century maximum has already been surpassed. From 330 onwards, well, but the new navy, following development, says well, counted denominations larger than the Chinese, the Decrees, the Force, and the Pentiers. The Besides needing larger crews, these heavier vessels carried missing threading catapults in the naval activity of antiquity. Different questions were made in two ways shipbuilding and the less costly capture of enemy ships. Shipbuilding took either the form of extraordinary, one off, and large scale projects. One such was launched in 378 or the form of regular shipping. The naval record of 357 which documents annual shipping from 363 to 357. From the 340s on, shipbuilding became even costlier as inaccessibility to Macedonian timber and its byproducts 
force Athens to seek more distant supplies. On the whole, deprived of its former ability to secure naval supplies to the imperial command or gut from diplomacy, 4th century Athens increasingly had to rely on market development arrangements run by well connected entrepreneurs. As the uh, Aristides or Antiochus is one of them. The operation of naval supplies market in the Piraeus is seen in full swing in 357 BC, with the nominal value of the hull and its equipment set at about 6,000 drachmas. The nominal total value of 410 units in 330 BC amounted to 2,460,000 drachmas, or 410 talents. The market value, however, remains unknown. <clears throat> the other component that evidences this relation, one waiting to be appreciated more fully by historians, is the rebuilding and expansion of the money cost without costly land based compound centered around the three naval harbors of the Piraeus, Carthos, Zea, and Munichia. The findings of the Zea Harbor project document the main phases of rebuilding and expansion to occur in the period following the near total destruction of the fortification walls and the dockyard. In 404 BC. Starting probably in the 390s, that process included A, the gradual reconstruction or repair of old ship sets, the hostile, B, the development of unbuilt harbor coastline with new ship sets, or alternatively, the conversion of unroofed Neosikoi into roofed ones, and C, perhaps in the 440s, the replacement in certain harbor, harbor sections of single ship sets with double ones, wherein the two ships were housed end to end on a single extended line. An indication that the number of ships was outgrowing the available harbor shoreline. Additionally, several naval storehouses appear to have been erected from the 370s onwards. The best known among these is Philo's storehouse, still of Italy, built at Zeta in 347. At some 4th century days, finally, Cantos and Munichia were provided with 45 harbor nodes and entrances. Each of these was a formidable project. The 4th century naval compound, one can say, outclassed its 5th century predecessor. Thus, by 330 29 BC, while the key number 410 ships, the ship sets in all three naval bases totaled 372, of which 94 were in Cantharus, 196 or 196 in Zea, and 82 in Munichia. The area occupied by these ship sets alone is estimated at close to 110,000 square meters. Being one of the largest building complexes in antiquity, these land-based facilities modularized naval power and transmitted the clear message that Athens was still a major, perhaps the major, player at sea. Another message they transmitted concerns public expenditure. No less than 240 talents were spent, after being raised to annual tax for any, on construction work done within just a seven-year period, from 347 to 330 BC. 240 talents is one-fourth of the amount which Isocrates claims imperial Athens had spent in total in the fifth century, she says. <clears throat> also, it is nearly half of the nominal value of the fourth fleet in 330 BC. If this creates the impression that land based infrastructure swallowed up more public funds than the three other major areas, those of maintaining, clearing, and operating the fleet, then that impression is illusory. For at 
expenditure of these three areas was instructed, entrusted to an institutional mechanism which, by the government from working individuals to defray expenditure directly and on the spot, converted huge amounts of private wealth into huge amounts of public revenue. This was the liturgy of the three areas. Section three, transformation. Besides being harnessed to a subtle labor taxation system, one designed to balance coercion and voluntarism between incentives and disincentives, the members of the Athenian property class were liable to the eyes for us and the price for us tax, while on occasions they contributed to ethnosis, the voluntary contributions. Traditionally, these taxpayers made up the core of the domestic branch of Athens in tax scholars tax. In the fourth century, however, they also still to become the principal branch of the tax state. For by then, gone were the two external revenue giants of the fifth century, the forest, paid by the Allies, and the Ipostate tax, 5% tax, that in 400, 414 was paid by maritime traders. Moreover, what had taken the place of these giants, the online syntaxes, soon proved inadequate and unreliable. In 378 7, as a result, Athens made its second bid for maritime hegemony in the Aegean with not even half of its imperial fiscal toolkit. The Athenian service wanted to play public without praise. Such are the streams of domestic revenue as were occasionally related to the military fund did little to ameliorate the situation. Naval commanders, strategoi as well as triarchs, had to find ways to put the middle. As contemporaries recognized, systemic failures in the external fiscal base were a constant feature of the fourth century. Besides increasing the burdens of the domestic branch of Athens, the tax state, these failures had two major consequences. For one, they changed the names of rational logic. From being, from being, from being predominantly a fund, uh, sorry, from being predominantly an instrument of war at sea, the expanding fleet tended now to become predominantly a fund raising instrument. Tapping through informal means, non Athenians and largely non public sources of cash to cover operational expenses became the order of the day. For another, Athens' state monopoly of maritime violence began gradually to be eroded, the erosion process being instigated by the Trinidadian class itself in a determined effort to reunite the private and the naval. One area in which Triarach seem to be reuniting the private and the neighbor is that of ship equipment. The various items of equipment that render the ship serviceable, that is, oars, rudders, sails, etc., well, well, after Hans himself, public property, the Ossias Kennedy. Last of these materials from the dockyards would likely parallel the name. And indeed, the neighbor records reveal several shortages in public equipment throughout the century. Two examples may illustrate this. A neighbor record from the, from the late 370s or early 360s reveals that there was no public equipment for over one third of the fleet. Again, the record of 357 6 shows that about one fifth of the fleet could not be fitted out because vital equipment was missing from the dockyards. A large part of that missing material was in the hands of true rights and major <coughs> officials, some of whom had been retained for a very, very long time. For instance, in the, four, in the 342 one, the dockyard superintendents were collecting debts owed from equipment that went back to 378-7. In 357 6, the fewer the trio of orchestrators, some of Britain, owned public equipment from earlier trio on four different ships. 
15 years later, he still had his arguments in his possession. As an opinion litigant put it, quote, there was not in the dockyard's equipment for the ships a third from whom it, whom it was due to have it in their possession had failed to return it, unquote. The same litigant notes that limiting the retention of equipment by some individuals and their refusal to return it were habitual. The sheer quantity is sometimes scandalous. One man would have equipment belonging to as many as 18 ships, which is equivalent to one, one half of the force stationed at the Mm Mithia. Another man would have, among other other items, hippozomata, as it verbs that are used to strengthen the power, hippozomata for 16 ships, made sails for 35, girls for 30, anchors for 34, and three complete set of oars, that is 510 oars. Captain Sogolos Kiladinaos, treasurer of the dockyards around 325 BC, with health equipment for no fewer than 10 Chinese. <coughs> Lack of money was definitely not the cause of the seemingly chronic imbalance between the fleet size of paper and the screen of sound. Were the shortages in question handling the effective operation of the fleet? The answer is a resounding no. Despite the imbalance, and at all times, even when there were vexatious delays, administrative chaos, and recalcitrant, Athenian fleets did manage in the end to sail out and to perform well in those situations. The evidence for the expeditionary forces dispatched each year is catalogued in an appendix to my class, 1993 presentation. The explanation of why the deficiencies mirrored in the naval records never transmuted into a serious impediment to the effective deployment of the fleet is provided by another well-documented fact, which will be mentioned only briefly here. This is the astonishingly large number of trilogs who possessed and used their own equipment. This practice seems widespread already from the early stages of the new navy. The one-third of the fleet which lacked black equipment in the 370s, 360s, was fitted out with privately owned equipment whose owners volunteered to give the various items as a loan to the state. Incidentally, one of these loans, a complete set of the trilogy, is in the name of the same orchestrators whom we have had as we founded for a very long time of public equipment to more ships. That the, neighbor, that the number of naval equipment owners was steadily growing is indicated by the Hieratimus decree of 357.6. For one, the decree ordered those owning equipment to sell it to the state, that it be authorized a compulsory sale, making defiance punishable with confiscation of the offender's property. For <coughs> another, the decree made the compulsory for trialites about to sell it, including including those who ordinarily use their own equipment to use exclusively public equipment, therefore forcing them, thereby forcing them to act as public debt <coughs> Individuals acquire equipment mainly in three ways. One, by purchasing from the open market. Two, by retaining public items long after the termination of the service. And three, by choosing to compensate the state for public equipment in their possession instead of returning it to the dockyards. They thereby became the legal owners of material which they have been misappropriated over a series of years. What they were actually practicing was the quite difficult but gigantic purchase on favorable terms of scanning from public stores. In about 356, a doctor superintendent named Satyros is said to have collected 34 talents from individuals earning public equipment. With a complete set value of 2,169 drachmas, the 34 talents translate into sets of scale for 94 trimenes, which is about one third of the fleet in 356. 
the transfer of naval equipment from the public dockyards to private hands had taken huge proportions. To sum up, from, three, from the 370s onwards, even before, the Tudorite class had been investing massively in naval material, and a major motivation for that investment always certainly that their wish to achieve relative, relative independence from public control. In other words, to reunite the private and the naval. At the same time, the members of that class were turning an entire state owned fleet into a partly private owned fleet. The momentous effect of this all was that the individual responsible for commanding and financing the Athenian fleet were slowly eroding the very monopoly of violence at sea, which had been the figurehead of the centralized tax state uninterruptedly since the fall of 1860. <clears throat> Active geographic service offered another opportunity to reunite the private and the naval. Those using that opportunity risked being castigated for converting their trip there to anarchy from the civic duty, later Gia, to personal economic gain, chaos, and a money-making expedient, climatic loss. Precisely, this charge was raised against Baidias, the target of the Muslim speech against Baidias, for allegedly having used the warship the captain as a clearer to transport personal possessions from his property as Stira on Ivoya to his house and similar money concession in Africa. But Baidias, Mr. Maynard, in this instance, was trivial compared to his blunder of the people of Kizikos. For five times, for five times, when he commanded the sacred tribe in Paradise. In terms of gain, though, Marius was outclassed by two triarchs and the two ambassadors they carried on their ship, one of them being the multi talented politician of Russia. En route to Caria in 55 BC, the four of them captured a merchantman from Locris, plundering it, plundering it for cargo worth nine talents. 3,000 practices. The loot from this assault and development, we should know, far exceeded what two Athenian allied states, Poleos and Eretria, paid in syntaxis for these five talents each. <coughs> Systematic resort to plunder and extortion in the ground of another group of individuals were situated in the shadowy end of the native Gia Primatismal spectrum. They are those who, through a mistress's triarchies, hired a triarchy from the, from the formerly appointed triarch, for them using the public worship now under their command to plunder and extort, extort indiscriminately everyone. Presumably, such instances were far more numerous than our sources document directly. These shadow triarchs appear to be defying Athens' violence monopoly in a rather audacious way. For not only were they operating under a shroud of anonymity, but they were also acting autonomously while they were members of the Athenian naval organization. Nevertheless, the practice was largely tolerated, not least because it allowed wealthy citizens who were unwilling or unable to captain the worship in person to do two things. To undertake realities only as financiers and to provide replacements for their active part of their service. Thus, the hiring of triarchies may have proven more effective than the naval reforms in the national sorcery in resolving at the crucial problem of manpower shortages. In this area, too, the triarchy class seems to have been pursuing its own agenda of turning a public labor gear into private privatismos. Inevitably, the overall effect of all these trades was that often a veritable Nauticon, maybe, was prone to slide into the operational realm of the lazy con, the pirate fleets. The critics felt that because of this, Athens, instead of the hegemony of Hellas, and I quote, had worn a name that stunk like a nest of pirates from the Osmos, unquote. 
Most, however, had no qualms about the fact that prediction had become upgraded into a nation that money time and <clears throat> as long as it had paid a good part of the guilt for the name. In the fourth century, Athens openly had embraced the reign mentality for good. Admitting that the truth he was advising to send against Macedonian territory in 351 BC could not be fully supported by public funds, Demosthenes stressed the necessity of having the navy perform an aristocrat, reinstating an unlimited. Using Lemnos, Tassos, Skiapos, and other islands as bases for plundering remedies. Demosthenes was proposing that to him, sending commanders to expeditions underfunded and giving them free reign to obtain funds, were as habitual in the 370s as it was later in the century. Accusations that these commanders were waging private wars totally lacked substance. Their untraditional methods were for the benefit of Athens. On his return from an expedition in 376, five Cabrias brought with him 300 slave slaves and other booty worth 110 talents. The expeditionary force under Timotheus in 376, five resorted partly to forced exactions of money from allies and non allies, partly to the sale of protection. During his lengthy expedition to Hercula in 372, the Tiklatis raided the Peloponnesian cities and exacted money from the from Catalonian tribes. In the 350s and later, extortion and the sale of protection to maritime merchants, whose payments to naval commanders were nicknamed the deductions for the novice, were building in sums that more than was from the root of the money which naval commanders reckoned this way often bifurcated, one part going to finance naval operations, another occasionally ending in private pockets. For example, the sums which the Stratosaurus Diotimos is said to have received as benefactions from shippers and merchants in 338 BC, and which he had kept with himself, totaled 40 talents. In comparison, the sums known to have been collected in syntaxes totaled 45 and 60 talents respectively. Not only were the so called benevolences competing with the syntaxes, they got the better of it. Embracing the operational logic of the name create flexible crews with multiple skills. In many situations, oarsmen had to double as light armed fighters. In anticipation of Nicholas Secundus' paper, however, I will not elaborate this point further. Here, I merely draw attention to the following that the crews which Apollodorus had hired, besides being excellent oarsmen, were proficient fighters from that platform. Conclusion. Thus, it seems that a new prince had been found to play the hundred. After all, he materialized as the disreputable trio of disreputable trio of plunder, extortion, and the sake of protection. Throughout the century, this trio provided supplementary but substantial funds with which to cover the navy's operational expenses. Domestic taxation, on the other hand, provided sufficient funds to pay for shipping and maintenance, and at least for the imposing down compound of naval installation. Contrary to what some scholars have claimed, Athens did not experience a profound crisis in the naval sphere caused by a lack of money. The navy was simply restructuring its functional inheritance, and in such a way as to bring the private and the naval closer to each other, or even to re reunite them. This was a much more fundamental and significant reform than the two known naval reforms of the fourth century. The Reinforced Reform of 358 which introduced the Trilaps Simulis, set the number of Trilaps to 1200, and sought to stop, unsuccessfully, the drain of public equipment from the dockyard. And the Dostomus Reform of 340 BC, which, contrary to what many scholars maintain, did not reduce the number of Trilaps to 300, but permitted those serving to achieve a more equitable distribution of the finances and burdens. Yet, even though each of them did make a difference, those reforms were targeted to 
was an issue that seemed less pressing, that of improving the Queen's readiness for as Moreover, Moreover, further reforms had only had technicalities rather than crucial issues about the asphyxiating description which uttered the various monopolistic states imposed onto the freedom of action of the very social sector that constituted the mainstay of the main. Some of these individuals chose to leave. Macaque for some of Alexis, her place his own tribe, which he married with his own crew, and set it off as an independent maritime operator. Those who chose to stay, however, seem to have took to heart, took to heart a principle which closely resembled that voiced by the revolting trio acts that science before it ever been seen. That henceforward they were to have what? Take matters into their own hands, unquote. And they would willingly contribute money and everything else required from their private estates, since the hardships now to be incurred were not so much for the sake of other people as for themselves. The new money seems to have been my private expense, my profit. Thank you very much.